um, good. through Fuel and wants to view it here live with us. These will be the people that will be interacting with you in the chat. Milwaukee, I see you coming on in the space. Come on in. Welcome to today's Race Bridge conversation. We're talking about racism in sports today. I'm so excited to have such a great group of athletes. Some of y'all bosses and co-workers can dunk on y'all and you don't even know. So this will be a chance for me to introduce you uh, to a panel of Milwaukeeans who, who have skills and you didn't know about it, but they also have a lot of insight and um, experience with uh, this topic, so I'm really excited to, to get started. So Fuel, you know how we do it. Uh, if you are in the space right now, go into the comment section, because I want you to own this space. I want you to get comfortable. Uh, the comment section is yours. The Q&A section is yours. If you uh, want to go into the comments section, the panelists will be able to interact with you in the comments. If you want to submit a question for uh, us to elevate to the panelists, go ahead and do that in the Q&A section. But right now, if you're in the space already, go to the comment section and let us know if you played uh, sports in uh, college or high school. And if, if you're like me and you didn't, because I didn't, um, I went to one practice and like, no, I just joined the poetry group after that. If that if you're like me, then go into the uh, comment section and let us know what your favorite sport is, and we'll we'll get us started like that. So let me see those comments start to come through. A lot of you are watching on Facebook today. If you're watching us on Facebook, go ahead and share uh, this video so all of your friends and other Milwaukeeans can see uh, their fellow Milwaukeeans and colleagues on this conversation. So excited to get started. I'm going to introduce you quickly to the panelists before we get started you'll get a chance to get up close and personal with each of them. Um, but I just kind of want to let you know where they are um, in the realm of this conversation and what sports they uh, played. David Bitten is the former director of competitive sports uh, with the Ministry of Culture and Sports in Israel. Uh, David might look familiar to you because he's been on the Fuel event before. Hey, David, thanks for being here. Wave to the folks. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening from Israel. Hi yeah. everyone. All the way Happy to be here with you again. Thank you so much. So Absolutely. good to have you. So good to have you. Next up, Tori Ball, Assistant Athletic Director for Marquette University. Tori played football at Syracuse University. Hey Tori. Hello, hello. How you guys doing? Good to have you here. Katie Anderson Knight is my one of my newest friends and my girl from way <laughs> back in the day when I first started at Fuel. We go way, way back. Uh, but Katie uh, was uh, on the swim team at Penn State University, and today she's the senior program manager at Johnson Controls. Hey, Katie. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Royce Nash is in artist, artist management with DigiGlow and Gang Management. Now he played basketball at North Dakota State and Viterbo University. Uh, 
Royce, how cold was it in uh, North Dakota? Colder than a polar bear's toenails. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we also have Peter Fox, who is an attorney at Fox and Fox. Uh, Peter played basketball at Yale and the University of St. Thomas. Hey, Peter. Hi, Corey. I got to make one correction. Now, uh -huh. I know Royce talked about my skills on the court, but I did not play basketball at Yale. I played football. Um, I wasn't quite good enough to play basketball at Yale, uh, but I did play football at, at Yale and at St. Thomas. So you're just multi-talented and you went yeah. to Yeah. I mean, I'd like to take credit for playing hoops at Yale, but that was not that was a no-go for me. <laughs> okay. Well, after, I will ask you about that. After, if we after Royce's Dominican team took us down in the playoffs, I knew that was the end of, uh, you know, organized hoops for me. <laughs> It was over. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Wylanda Glover, who is the head strategist, consultant, and principal at uh, Wylanda DLLC. She played basketball at Indiana University. Hey, Wylanda. Hey, Corey. Thank you so much for being here. So let's get move forward. I want to thank our media sponsor. You heard a little bit from them as we were waiting for you to come into this space. Radio Milwaukee 88.9, to me, one of, one of the most listenable stations um, that I've ever heard. Even if I don't know the artist, when I turn it on, I can listen to whatever it is that they're playing. Uh, but they're more than just a radio station. What we have here is a screenshot of their website. When you go to the website, there is page after page after page of different stories about people, places, and things that make Milwaukee a great place. So they're a great champion of Milwaukee, and they are doing a really great job of telling our stories. Makes me feel special. So check out 88.9, and thanks to them for sponsoring this. You're probably, if you took tune in, you'll hear them talking about the race bridge conversations and fuel. So we really appreciate that. Now, Tanya Mazur posner is a good friend of mine at this point. We have done so many projects and uh, events together. She is the VP of Development for the Jewish Home and Care Foundation. And I'm gonna stop sharing quickly so you can see her face. Hey, Tanya. Listen, I want you to talk to the folks a little bit about why we decided to partner on this uh, particular conversation and anything else that you um, wanna share with the group. Wait, let me unmute you, go ahead. Um, so hi, everybody. So Corey Joe and um, the Jewish Home and Care Center Foundation and Fuel Milwaukee have been partnering for about two years now on various activities. Um, and actually, this is my second time being on one of your live stream panels. Um, and I think this is a, kind of a snowball effect from that particular panel. Um, the subject of uh, race relations and racism is a very important subject in the Jewish community. Um, it is an important subject for the Jewish Home and Care Center Foundation because while we are a Jewish senior living community, we accept people of all races and religions. And um, this subject is near and dear to many of our residents and our staff members. Um, we have over 500 staff members that work for our organization. And, um, and David, who um, you'll hear from also, um, has been, uh, uh, participant or on a panel in the past with Fuel Milwaukee. And while one would think that um, Israel is um, only the people, you know, the land of the Jewish people, it is such a melting pot of um, Jews from all uh, different backgrounds and also people of different religions and nationalities. Um, so um, David's going to share with you um, how Israel is really at the forefront of handling race relations and, um, and race issues. And it's really fascinating. So I'm really proud to, again, partner with you, Corey Joe. I love you. You know that you're my personal friend. And um, it's just uh, such an honor to be, again, a uh, part of this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. I always appreciate your partnership. You've helped Fuel expand our international reach with uh, David. So of course, I'm very appreciative of that. All right, let's see what else we got going here work through the rest of the slides. Okay, let's kick off the conversation. So before I um, go to the panelists with the first question, I wanted to start off uh, this conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, just to set the tone a little bit. We can go so many different places when you talk about sports and racism. So the way I'm thinking of, of this or the framework is really kind of around looking at um, the business of sports in the front office and leadership and, um, you know, the 
composition of that leadership and what it looks like and why. Um, and then looking at compensation um, and scholarship. So kind of grouping that together. The other area which the panelists will be able to speak to a lot is student affairs, academics, um, recruitment, any racism or issues, inequities around that practice as it relates to sports and why. Um, coach and player um, relations, we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about fan abuse and stereotypes and the way that those things are perpetuated or not by messaging in sports. I wanted to start off with this short clip. It's about two minutes um, from uh, CBC News where they give a really good uh, illustration of what we're talking about and what some of the facets of racism in sports look like. So um, let me reshare that to make sure I got my sound on. I keep forgetting to click that. Okay, I'm gonna play this and then we'll get started with the conversation. We'll come right out of this video clip and I'll come straight to you, uh, David, for your uh, comment. Here we go. I don't see your views. I, I wasn't raised the way you were well, raised. Then if, if you don't feel it, don't come to my games. Don't bring black people and don't come. One horrible racist rant has been the sports headline this week, along with a reaction from the National Basketball Association and elsewhere. But this is a bigger story than Clippers owner Donald Sterling. Racism in sports crosses leagues, genders, and global boundaries. So how do we affect a game changer? We'll get to that in just a bit. But first, some more shameful moments in recent sports history. Marge Schott was the colorful owner of the Cincinnati Reds. But in 1996, she was banned from running the team after making racist comments, including this shout out for Adolf Hitler. He was good. Everybody in history knows that he did was good at the beginning, but he just went too far. Schott sold the team three years later. Radio host Don Imus made a career out of being cranky. That, that ass eating granny had on his But face. in 2007, that rough. couldn't excuse what he said about the Rutgers women's basketball team. Awesome some rough girls from Rutgers, man. They got tattoos and some hardcore hoes. That's, that's a nappy headed hose there, I'm gonna tell you that now. Sponsors fled no, and Imus was fired from his CBS radio show. In 2011, this grainy cell phone video was a huge embarrassment for the NHL. During a preseason game in London, Ontario, a fan threw a banana peel at Wayne Simmons, a black player with the Philadelphia Flyers. Simmons got his revenge by scoring. And just this past weekend in Spain, racism in soccer once again reared its ugly head. Another banana targeted at a black player. Danny Alves picked it up, ate it, and then carried on playing for the win. So we've gathered some very special guests tonight to talk about racism in sports. And there we go. So some other moments that I wanted to share that weren't in the uh, video. Um, a couple of instances that I, I remember from when I was um, younger as a kid. I didn't really know exactly what was going on, but I just remember hearing these stories. Um, more recently, Fuzzy Zoller uh, talking about Tiger Woods. Um, and Royce, are, are, are you unmuted? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Tell a little bit of background on this comment because I got I added this because of what you told me about it. Tiger Woods had won what? Okay, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from what I remember, Tiger Woods had won the Masters, which is you know one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, uh, tournament that you can win in the PGA. And one of the uh, many things that come with winning the Masters is you know you get the green jacket and everyone celebrates you. And mind you, Tiger Woods was probably, if not the youngest, one of the youngest people to ever win the Masters at this point back in 1997. And um, I'm not for sure if he was the first black, but I'm sure he's one of the only blacks to have ever won the Master, if not the only. But one of the things that come with winning Masters is um, the winner gets to pick what the dinner will be that evening at, you know, the dinner that they have. And when Tiger Woods was getting his jacket and they put his green jacket on for him to represent the winner of the Masters, which is the highest, you know, in golf. So Fuzzy Zoller, he comes on and he makes a comment to a reporter and says, well, 
I guess now uh, fried chicken and collard greens would be on the menu tonight or, you know, something along that lines to, you know, take a jab, you know, at, at Tiger Woods being black. And, and winning the Masters. Yeah, there's a grainy video, um, and, and lots of, we, I was in high school when this happened, so there's lots of folks that probably remember this um, happening, and there's video of it on YouTube. I mean, there's so much stuff on YouTube. I also wanted to remember Jimmy the Greek uh, and his comments about uh, African-American people having an extra muscle. He made a lot of comments, and I just pulled a part of what he said during this conversation. I was a little kid when this happened, and I remember kind of, uh, not fully understanding what was going on, but I just remember the upset um, that people felt um, uh, around this. So, David, listen, that video is heavy, and it, there's a blend there of, uh, you know, instances of racism that have happened in the U.S. and internationally. You and I have talked a little bit about um, the things that you've experienced as a player and a, a coach and just promoting sports as a great means of togetherness but what about the ugly side of it what have you experienced experienced and what's your reaction to that video oh, let me unmute uh, can you unmute me there you go there you go you you referring to me uh, yeah. Corey? yep mm -hmm. okay so uh Hi everyone, good evening again. Yes, I, I did face it uh, while we played um, in Europe, but I would like to start my, my discussion with you um, regarding what, what we do in Israel first, then Europe, and then I will share with you some of my personal experience experiences. So first in Israel, I, I would like to tell you it is an issue. It is an issue and because mainly because the diversity, diversity that we have have in Israel. We have so many different uh, communities, so many different people come, came from different cultures, different places. So you don't have only a Jews, uh, a black Jews came from Ethiopia, for example. You have, you have Jews came from Russia, you have Jews came from all over the world in Israel. So that brings a lot of diversity, a lot of different communities. Not only that, Israel is facing diversity regarding the, the, the Muslims and the Christians, the, the Arabs, the Druze, the Bedouins. So Israel is basically, as Tanya said in the beginning, really a melting pot. So because of that, sometimes people that doesn't know each other enough um, will, especially fans during uh, mainly basketball and soccer games, uh, will have um, racist comments and whatsoever um, uh, comments that are not appropriate. So until 2008 in Israel, okay, so it was inappropriate, but the government really didn't do much about it. But since 2008 in Israel, they, they, we have a law. We have a law in Israel against uh, racism and against violence in sports. So basically today and since then, 12 years since then, we had so many uh, uh, progress and improvement in, in this field because it's not only uh, about education now. It's not only about programs and initi initiatives that different communities will have different uh, initiatives and different programs together. But now, when you do have any kind of racist comment in Israel, you are breaking the law. Mm -hmm. So when, and not only that, not only that, the Ministry of Sports in Israel actually formed a special uh, police force to handle in the different arenas, those uh, comments, those fans who does not respect the law. So Israel is really facing uh, um, um, the, this issue. But as I said, we improve uh, every year. Every year we improve in different, uh, different subjects and, and really I don't have enough time to share with you the different activities and initiatives that we're doing, including the president of Israel investing approximately $5 million a year. So different communities and different uh, 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 sports club from, from, as I said, from different cultures, we'll do, do pro together, we'll, we'll, we'll have games together, the level of, of violence and, and racism in Israel. So we did have a lot of progress, a lot of improvements, but we still have a, a lot of work to do. Now, regarding uh, the situation in Europe, Every year in Strasbourg, France, 
We do have a European convention that different representative, I was the representative of Israel in this convention. So you will find a representative from, from Belgium and Germany and France and Great Britain. And each and every representative is sharing his knowledge and, and his experience with the different representative of the different countries. So we learn from each other. So the, the situation now in Spain and in France and in Great Britain is so much better because all the countries in Europe are cooperating regarding this issue of, of racism and violence in sports arena. Um, now I will share a little bit from my experience. As I told you, I, I play professional basketball and you know that Israel is playing in Europe. So of course, uh, BDS movements coming to different arenas and um, try to give us hard time, but law enforcement communities are really protecting uh, Israel teams overseas. We have as well our own security. So things are really handled beautifully regarding safety and security of the athletes, the Israeli athletes uh, overseas. Yes, I face that, but it's not really something that uh, got into my head, if, if I may use this expression. It's, it's a part of, of what we have to handle. I must say there, as I said before, there is a, a meaningful improvement regarding the, those issues as well. And the level of safety and security is, is so much higher than it was 10 or, or 20 years ago because it is an issue in Europe as well. And we saw in the videos what happens in, in Spain or, or different places. But I can tell you uh, that the governments are, are, are doing a wonderful job uh, handling this issue and we see a lot of uh, if, if improvements. Thanks, David. Tori, I'll come to you. The, uh, the video that I showed, uh, all the clips were from, um, you know, professional sports teams and, um, and games. But what, is, what was your experience as a student uh, athlete? Did you experience racism on the team with the fans? What did that look like for you? So I, I'll just come back to one one uh, example from my time playing. Uh, we played in West Virginia. I don't know if anybody's ever been to West Virginia. It's, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, West Virginia is just one of those places for me, and I've been there four or five times, uh, that I never had a good experience there. Uh, so when we went to West Virginia, some of the players, uh, they used the N-word uh, as we're playing in the game. So it's, it, I mean, it, it throws you off a little bit, but it, but it also doesn't, it, it doesn't surprise me uh, because after the game, West Virginia won this particular game, they threw oranges at us because they were going to the Orange Bowl and, and people had all kinds of fruit. So like the, the clip where uh, we saw the guy get the banana thrown at him, he picked up the banana, ate it. I kind of felt like that. Uh, David said something that resonated with me, uh, that they're getting better with racism, um, but it's something that they, they, um, they he, he, you just get used to and you want to handle. It shouldn't be something that we get used to. We shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be put in a place where we have to handle racism, right? Um, so, so in my experience, I have experienced that in certain areas, but I, I think we're getting better to the point where, you know, we're, we're able to call it out. Uh, but also we're, we're coming to a place where um, it's not tolerated by if you're, if your teammate is doing something, you call them out. If you're, if a player on the other's team is doing something, uh, if the referees are calling it out. Um, and, and just like in the NFL right now that they're, they're, they tried it, uh, it didn't work. They tried to uh, ban the N word. So the referee would throw penalties for the N word. Uh, obviously it didn't happen just because it, there's so much, in, so many intricacies in that word. Uh, that that it didn't work out the way that they wanted it to, um, but we are all getting better in the realm of race and race relations within sports. It's definitely not where it needs to be. I will say that. Um, so yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, Wailana, I want to ask you. So part of the part of the reason why I wanted to do this is, as I started to do more research about racism in sports, it it kind of butted against this, what I feel like is the branding of sports as the great equalizer and uh, it brings everybody together and it's this great opportunity for, you know, growth and upward mobility for um, 
student athletes and just a lot of positivity. And then I think about all of the movies about sports where you got like, remember the Titans or the uh, blind, whatever the movies are. And it's like, it starts off with this really a lot of tension on the team. And then they play together and win together and it breaks down all the barriers and everyone loves each other. And it's the team against the crowd. And I'm just wondering how much of that is reality in your experience. What was your experience with the team, with the crowd? What did that feel like to you when you were playing? Well, I would uh, give you two stories. The first story, um, my freshman year, uh, we had to watch Hoop Dreams, which, and I was, and um, my roommate was the second African-American female to be recruited. Um, to watch to to Indiana University to play basketball, and I was the third African American uh, person. Unfortunately, her freshman year she got injured, so I had to travel, and they had room. We were roommates, which meant I was rooming by myself, right? So um, just being coming from Milwaukee, born and raised, went to Washington High School, uh, being first generation, low income. Um, I had to learn the politics. And if anyone knows anything about Indiana University, I didn't know I was going to the basketball capital of the United States, which it had its own layer of politics. Um, if you knew, know anything about Bobby Knight, so just being on the women's team versus the men's team, even though we were all close together because we did everything together outside of um, practice, uh, I did experience my um, own set of racism. And uh, one story I will leave you with is uh, I was on the National Honor Roll Society when I um, left high school. I could have gotten an academic scholarship. So my first meeting with my academic advisor, apparently she didn't look at my record. So she put me in a lot of classes that um, was based on my skin color. So I even asked her, I said, did you even look at my record? She said, no. So she opened it up and I began to have a conversation with her so she can get to know me, right? Because again- You have the boldness to do that as a, as a student. Well, this, and this is, this, I have the experience here because in high school, I, was, I worked two years in a guidance counselor's office, right? So I had mentors who allowed me to know what to expect and what to ask for. Okay. So they allowed me to be an advocate for myself. So I was, I was fortunate with um, knowing the importance of speaking up and asking and understanding um, what I was getting into, right? Even though I wasn't getting it from home, I got it um, in high school. So in uh, my love for chemistry and math grew out of uh, my relationships with my teachers at Washington High School. So I knew what I wanted to major in, but she was just looking at me as an African-American girl, probably saw um, my low income, uh, my record, and just judged me. Uh, I was a chemistry major for three years um, at Indiana University. So I had, we had to, I, I had to fight to get into a chemistry class, you know. Uh, so my my stint started my first time on campus, just getting my classes. Wow! And then he, as a fan, just walking the street, um, you know, being called a black nigger bitch, you know, taking out the garbage, staying in the community. So there's a lot of different things that I've experienced, uh, and not only just racism, but the politics of basketball playing in Indiana. Alanda, it's it, and I'm speaking from my perspective, and I'm probably you know a couple years younger than you. Um, I had that same experience. I legit had that same experience, and I have student athletes that come in with some of the same experiences that I've had. So they just get shuffled into this area where they're supposed to be, um, mm -hmm. and if they don't speak up for themselves, they 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 are placed there. Those are the places that they do put them in. So I, I hate to see that it's a continuing cycle in some ways. Mm -hmm. Royce, you had a similar um, experience. And actually, you, I, I, I'm curious to talk about your experience overall. So you, uh, just to fast forward and give a little bit of your background, you're a Milwaukee native from 5320 
six. Six. So yeah. we all know that the, we've seen the documentaries and that we know what that um, zip code is in Milwaukee. So it's a challenging area. And then you go to Dominican, <laughs> which was a completely different world. What was your experience playing sports um, in high school? And did you have any instances? Like, I'm really curious about the academic uh, assumptions um, that are made about uh, athletes based on their color. Well, actually, my, my experience started, you know, much earlier in high school. I was a Chapter 220 student. So I was being bused from, you know, 16th and Capitol out to 124th and Center to go to Whitman Middle School. That was for 7th and 8th grade. And for elementary, I was bused from there to go out to 100th and I believe it was Congress. So those were both schools that were in Wauwatosa. And, you know, I grew up across the street from a playground. So we've been playing basketball as far as we can remember. That was the way we expressed ourselves. That was a way we established uh, who was who, you know, around the playground and around the neighborhood. So by the time I got to school, I was playing with all, you know, white kids. And for the most part, back during this time period, their sport was soccer and they didn't really play basketball like that. But my experience was once basketball season came around, um, I became everyone's best friend, and then I became some people's enemy. Um, and you just get, not to go too down any avenue too much, I, I just, in a nutshell, would say sports for me, it's like it was the, it's, it's one of the best things and, 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 and worst things almost that, that can happen when it comes to improving race relations because in sports, I did play on those teams my whole life, you know, middle school, high school, elementary, I played against the schools that was up north in Green Bay and Kakana and Appleton in Janesville. I mean, you know, getting called it, you know, whatever they call it is they, you, check this out. This is how creative racism is. Instead of the, what they call, I don't even like saying the N-word, but I've been called a moon cricket. That's creative, a moon cricket. And, you know, it was, it's been so much stuff we've been caught in. We've actually laughed at times because it's like, how do you even think of that? But it's a sadness to it. And we, we sort of had to learn at an early age. Me, when I say we, me and the one or two other black guys that may have been on my team. And this is all the way through high school, through college. Because after I left, you know, Dominican, I went to Fargo, North Dakota in 1991. They didn't have BET. You know what I'm saying? So you hear so many things, but you also meet so many people. And in sports, there is a moment where regardless of what color you are, where you from, how you was raised, it's me against you. And it comes down to a heart and it comes down to a desire and it comes down to who wanted the most. Mm -hmm. And when you go through enough of those battles with enough different people from different cultures, then you get to find out that this is a platform in which, you know, the real rise to the top and, and, and who you are, you, your inside shows, your character shows, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk to the top athletes, when you meet those superstars when you meet those people, that's really good. Okay. A lot of it is natural talent, but a lot of the other common traits that people who make it to the top of their level or the top of their career is they're hard workers. They um, service, they look how they can help. They're the first to come. They're the last to leave. Mm -hmm. And it, it don't matter what color you are because you will tend to like and have love for and want to go to war for anybody who acts like that. Yeah. Peter, how about you? What was your, uh, I know you have a, there's some similarities between your story and Royce's, but maybe like in the reverse. Hey, absolutely. Wow. It's, it's totally in the reverse. Um, you know, I, it, Royce and I were talking yesterday and I mean, you got to, one of the most important things, no matter where you are and what you're doing, you got to be you. Mm -hmm. um, and I came from, I came from privilege um, and I, you know, I'm not ashamed of it. But it's, it's also something that's not always easy to talk about when, when you're talking about a lot of the topics that I talk about every day. And I grew up in a, you know, I, I grew up in a place where, you know, we, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have needs. Um, it was different than Royce growing up in the 53206. But what, what, what I had was a set of parents and a set of siblings that encouraged participation in everything and, and reaching out and exploring 
whatever it is that you wanted to explore. And for me, as a, at a young age, it was sports were the thing that I explored all the time. And that led me to different teams, including basketball teams. And ultimately, and ironically, one of the panelists reached out earlier and said, hey, I'm, I was Pete Fox's AAU coach, Jim Sinclair. He's on it. I saw a chat message from him that came out. <clears throat> I met Jim when I was 12 years old, and, and Jim uh, started an AAU team. And the first year of the AAU team, I was the only white kid on it. And it was awesome. But it was new, and it was new for my family. It was new for my for my parents, uh, who would come to practice and games. And we started to get involved in this group of families that became and have still become been my lifelong friends. I mean, Jim Sinclair is one of my mentors, and we are a collection of all of the things that we do. I like to think that you know every experience we have should lead us to where what we're doing next. And Sports were a big part of my life all the way through college and then afterwards playing, still playing basketball and, and other, uh, you know, recreational sports. But it, it, my interests now and what I do for a living probably started um, with those early teams with Jim Sinclair and the people that I met and the friends that I've met and kept my whole life. That's so awesome. I, it, it's very different. You know, I, uh, it, it, if I look back and if I had a rewind button, could I see that there were, there would ever be tension when I'd go to a gym and, you know, we'd be playing in the inner city with my AU team against another AU team. And I look different than everyone on the court, probably, but it's, it's different. It's a different thing for me than it is when, when there's, you know, the, the, the history and, and hatred and ignorance behind um, the things that Yolanda and Tori and Royce have experienced. Cause it's, that's just, that's not what I was exposed to. And, and you, you, you see that perspective and it hurts. Thanks, Peter. Katie, I'll come to you, our only swimmer on the panel. So your experience was a little different than the one shared um, here, maybe more an issue of uh, lack of inclusion than direct racism, but just share a little bit about what your experience was as a student swimmer. Yeah, I, w well, I was going to comment when Royce was talking about, you know, the basketball court across the street and swimming is a very different sport in that you have to have access to a pool, you have to be able to get to the pool, you have to have instruction in swimming, right? And so it tends to be, for all sorts of historical reasons, it tends to be a very white sport. Um, and, and, and so my experience as a white person with white people, <laughs> you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't directly, you know, ever really encounter um, people being racist in the context of competitive swimming, in my experience. Um, however, I know that it exists, because, you know, there's so many historical issues going back, you know, generations related to uh, swimming pools being segregated, um, public pools becoming private pools to keep people out, right? Historical, you know, fears in families of swimming and so people don't know, learn how to swim. There were a couple of drownings just this summer here in Milwaukee, um, black, young black folks. And so, um, you know, so there's, there's a very strong history of, um, you know, maybe not intentional exclusion of, in the sport of swimming. I think that the sport itself is trying very hard to be inclusive and to do more outreach with swim lesson programs. Um, but, you know, partially to counter the horrible drowning statistics, but also, you know, just because, you know, sports themselves are trying to bring more people in to compete to keep the sport itself alive, right? Um, so, you know, so anyway, I mean, I think, you know, there were there were a couple of black guys on our Penn State swim team. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking in, in preparation for this, you know, I was like, gosh, I should have reached out to them to find out, you know, what they experienced as, you know, black people in Big Ten competitive swimming, because uh, there's there certainly weren't many of them. Um, but, you know, I think it's true that your performance speaks for itself. And so when thinking about college scholarships and and things like that, I read an article um, where Cullen Jones, who's, you know, who was an Olympic champion, um, black swimmer, talked about, you know, on some level, like you, you you know, your performance in the pool speaks for itself, right? You're, may, you may be the only black swimmer, but if you win, you win. You break a world record, it's your world record, right? Nobody's going to take that away from you. Um, but I think that, that there is for sure an issue of, of access and inclusion in, in the sport. So I know, David, you um, have coached. Have, has anybody else coached um, students or kids? So yeah. let's talk, let's, we can, ex and I'll kind of open it up. Let's explore this idea of 
the the lack of access to certain sports for kids and how that's going to play out in in the future um how do we give kids access to pools and golf and you know i think my son would be really good at soccer i think it's the sport he would be interested in but it's it's not something that i would it's easy it was just way easier for me to put him in basketball like that was the easiest thing uh we didn't necessarily have a lot of access or easy access to some of the other sports david i'll start with you and your experience with coaching how have you been able to help you know cross some some barriers or break some of those borders there well, in Israel, the, the two most popular sports are soccer and basketball, in that order. Um, beyond them, far beyond them, you will find all the rest. So the government really invent a lot of money, invest a lot of money uh, in soccer fields and basketball arena. So those two sports are really taking care on the highest level of the Israeli government. So there is no one kid in Israel, and it doesn't matter which community is coming from that he won't have the possibility to have a nice basketball uh, arena and a very decent uh, uh, soccer field to play. Now, regarding all the rest, all the, the swimming pools, the golf courts, and these are very uh, specific, unique sports. So uh, because of the numbers, because of the, the numbers, mainly the, the family will have to, to do an extra effort to find the specific golf court, to, to find the specific swimming pool, so their kids will be able to participate in a certain uh, sports program. And because the, the numbers are not, um, the, the value of the numbers are not that high in Israel regarding all, all those little sports that I've mentioned. So the government will help, but in a lower, um, lower investments regarding those very specific uh, sports. How about in the U.S.? But as I said in the beginning, no, go ahead, David. Okay, but just, just yeah, yeah, just 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 one uh, thought. Um, basically, uh, um, the the municipalities have a big role in Israel finding a solution. Not only the government, the municipalities, the cities, the mayors will are taking uh, their part in finding the right places, uh, the, the the right budget. So. Um, any kid who would like to do any sport will have the opportunity to do it. And this is very important to, to say. How about in the U.S., um, folks that have coached or been around students, have you seen any programs or progress on, on that account? I, I'll just say, you know, I know that, that USA Swimming as an organization has a program called Make a Splash, where there's a really intentional effort to get swim lessons into public schools and, and in, into cities. Um, for, for exactly that reason, I mean, swimming is a life skill and it's a life saving skill. And so, so starting there with, um, you know, reducing, reducing the drowning rate by teaching people how to swim and, and bringing those programs to, to kids. But I think as David said, there's a role of the municipality in not closing pools, right? Finding the funding to keep neighborhood pools open, not converting them to splash pads. You can't learn to swim in a splash pad, right? So it solves, you know, the cool off problem, but it doesn't solve the drowning problem. And so I think there has to be an investment um, by communities in, you know, in life, state, life, life skills. Well, anybody else? I don't want to cut I, I just want to add, um, when I started playing, um, I played from grade school to high school. And in high school, had an opportunity to play in the Warning basketball. So as you know, in the city of Milwaukee, Warning started with only the boys' team. So I was the first um, girls' team to play at MLK Center. So I'm thankful right now that not only do you have AAU, but you have now high schools that are offering summer leagues to expose um, students. And when I coach, one of the things too is having access, and this may sound um, real simple, but having access to having your own basketball uh, and not having to borrow basketball to actually practice. Um, and, I, and, and I buy basketballs and mentor women, and I'm, I'm just fortunate now that the opportunity for women to not only play locally, but maybe play nationally. Uh, but there also are um, money issues. So there are students who may be 
athletic and can play, but they don't have that exposure. I was fortunate that my uncle invested in my, in summer leagues. I got recruited because of the um, leagues I played in and the camps I went to during the summer, right? Had I not had that exposure, I don't know if I would have been heavily recruited. Uh, so there is um, a process in the system and the education, um, no matter what race you are, but definitely if you're an African American female, you do need someone who understand the process of getting into school. And it's not just basketball, but it's developing you as a person and your humanhood. Um, and that's what I teach and coach um, to the women I mentor. Um, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show my screen because I want to give you show you guys this website that I found it, that kind of um, monitors different sports and gives them a grade about uh, their inclusion and in, uh, of people of color and uh, women. But before I do that, I want to encourage all the participants, uh, two things, go in the chat and let me know if I'm guessing that there are a lot of sports fans or sports related uh, or this is an affinity group within fuel of people who love sports or are athletes. That's what I'm guessing. Is that who's listening? If that is the case or not, go in the chat and let me know if you're surprised at anything that you learned today. Have any of the panelists said anything about their experiences that you just didn't know and that you're shocked by? The other thing I want the participants to do is at this point, go into the chat and leave any questions because we're about at the 15 minutes left mark and uh, we're gonna start to pull from your questions. Um, to wrap up the conversation. Now, Tanya is going to be monitoring the chat and pulling out the questions um, if we have any that come through. Originally, we were going to have her off screen. I decided to leave her on screen because I love her facial expression. So that's why she's not saying much, but she's here to go in the, she, she's ready to go in the chat and uh, elevate any of your questions up. So as I'm doing um, that, let me see. I'm Okay, I'm going to share this. This is the website that I was talking about. So it's the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sports. So what I think is really interesting about this is that they have all of these reports that they do and they count incidences of uh, racism and give um, scores. And it's, it's showing this sort of rapid progression for uh, the NBA, which kind of leads me to this idea of what do you all think about organizations like this, uh, you know, teams, people, members really holding these teams accountable because that report card is about all of those things that I talked about before. So the who's in the front office, um, you know, compensation, the advertisement, the language they use. So they're kind of checking them on all points to make sure that they aren't doing anything that excludes or um, is unfair to, uh, to people of color and women. Let's talk about that. Do you think these organizations are a good idea? Do they work? Are you seeing changes? David, I saw you unmute yourself. I'm, I'm going to start off with you. Yes, absolutely, because uh, we do that in Israel, actually in Europe, not only in Israel. And this is one of the things that the Israeli government and other governments decided to do, to give responsibilities to the teams. The teams are accountable uh, for the fans. So whenever the fans are not tolerant and have um, any incidents of violence and racism, the team are going to, uh, to um, I don't know, sometimes they have to pay a, a five. Sometimes uh, they, are, they are going to court. So it depends the volume of those incidents. But now the teams in Israel are accountable for the behavior of their fans. So what they do now, a lot of arenas you have sold out. So the, the teams know exactly which person is going to, is where, where he's going to sit. So they know exactly uh, who, who is the, the, the person, um, where he's going to sit. So you have full control of the audience, full control of the fans. And when you're talking about huge arenas, huge, huge soccer uh, arenas in, in Europe, for example, you have 80,000 uh, people and the, the tickets are sold out and you cannot buy a ticket without your idea, without your name. And that gives a lot of control to the law enforcement community and for the, for the teams. 
So this is something, for example, that um, now it's going around all over Europe and all over the fans. Um, and this is how we control the fans. And uh, it's, it's a very good thing that happened in the last, the progress that I've mentioned in the beginning that happened in the last, that happened in the last few years. I mean, I think that is so great. Like, I, we need to integrate some sort of system like that as well. Because, I mean, you need to be graded because, I mean, you get graded on everything else. Are, hey, are you making enough dollars? Are you making enough calls? Are you reaching out to season ticket holders? So why not be the great... Why not be created on your um, diversity initiatives? Um, I, I'm actually on a alumni task force at Syracuse where we just hired a person on climate and inclusion, and that's part of his job. Uh, his job is to integrate those grading systems, come up with, hey, what, why, why do we need these things? And then coaches for our existing coaches. So the football coach will have to integrate some sort of um, system and sit, make sure there's some sort of system in place for his players. Um, to get diversity and inclusion training, but also his his other coaches to get diversity and inclusion training, um, and and I think it's a great idea because you you actually put your money where your mouth is. Uh, if we can just be mouthpieces uh, and say we're going to do these things, but if we don't put a grade behind it, what does it really matter? So I think it's a good idea. Absolutely. Peter, you work in this world of kind of like holding people accountable. Yeah. Uh, do you, what do you think about that? Is, is I, I, I mean, I love it. It's really interesting to read it. And I, I try to get to it before our, our call today to kind of go through it. It was a little hard to fumble through uh, quickly, but I, I love it. And it, quite frankly, it didn't surprise me to see where, you know, see how the NBA rated so highly because I mean, they just seem to be doing things right and, and making it at, you know, the, a front, a front issue for them. And, and that I hope redounds to the benefit of everyone because they should be leading the way for the other uh, professional sports, in my opinion. Didn't surprise me that their grades are so high. Mm -hmm. Tanya, what are you- I think the real, one thing that I add though, is I think the real important thing is to, uh, anytime you're doing any kind of grading like this or evaluating something as, as, um, I guess hard to really put in numbers is diversity. You've got to have good metrics in place to understand what it is they're measuring and how those grades are being given so that people understand not only who's doing it right, but how can we get better? Yeah, you're definitely trying to be quant like, it's, it's a qualitative thing, but you're trying to put a quantity on it. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely hard. I can definitely see that. I was just thinking too, when I was looking at that, Corey Joe, does the NBA see that and does the NCAA see that and like what's the what's the feedback loop with that is it you know is it is it this institute and this guy sort of doing this grading work like then what right and so that was just my question as I looked at it because I think that there has to be it has to have some influence in the organizations that they're actually grading and they have to see it as something that they want to <laughs> yeah that people are kind of right? waiting for the reports to come out and it means something right and it means something exactly Tanya, what are you seeing in the, um, I know you're on Facebook too, so what are the overall conversations, comments? So I wanted to make a comment because I'm a professional fundraiser. And when I first started in the field, which is like over 25 years ago, there were not that many organizations that were investing in young, um, diverse athletes. And it's so prominent right now. And I think it's fantastic because you're giving, you know, a young person access that probably wouldn't have had that opportunity otherwise. And really the impact of sports on a young person is profound because it has a great effect on their academic um, and social achievement. So, um, you know, this subject really resonates with me. Um, I saw a question actually in the chat, um, which actually dovetails to what I just said. How can we help young people who are passionate about sports understand that there are so many other career opportunities in sports off the court or off the field. So I guess I'm gonna open that up to anyone who's on the panel right now. I really think it's our responsibility to reach back. I, I mean, playing football at Syracuse, so I'm gonna just toot my horn for a little bit for one second. 
So I played football at Syracuse. As I was playing football at Syracuse, I interned with Martha Stewart uh, in New York City. So I would go from Syracuse, it's a four-hour drive, to New York City on the weekends to try to figure out if I wanted to do that. I realized I didn't want to do that. Um, and so I came back to the athletic department. I was like, hey, is there anything around? You know, I got my degree in communication, um, and then I have a master's degree in marketing. Anything that I can do to help the department. Um, and my athletic director created a position for me. He, he, it was a black man and he was like, hey, you, you're doing the right thing. You're trying to figure out what, you're, what you really want to do in life. And he said, I'm just going to try you out in this thing. And if you love it, let me know and we can try to figure it out from there. I think there needs to be a lot more of those people out there. There needs to be a lot more people reaching back. And if students come to us with some sort of you know, plan or if they come to us and say, hey, I like this thing, we need to be the responsible for saying, okay, well, maybe you can try this, or maybe you can try this, and we need to use our connections to get them somewhere. Uh, I think I I try to do that every in every way I can, especially working with college uh, students because they really don't know what they want. I'm I'm gonna be honest. They're, I'm sorry <laughs> to these people that are paying uh, tuition for their kids, but they really don't know what they want. Um, <laughs> so I think it's it's up to us to help them out. There's, a, there's actually a very interesting question in the chat. Um, we continue to see more and more explicit statements about racism and social justice by athletes, whether it's Black Lives Matter on the backs of jerseys, kneeling, making statements on social media. So any one of you panelists, um, how do you respond when, um, when, they per when you personally come across critiques about sports not being the place to make these kinds of statements? Well, I, sports are exactly, I love that they're making statements in sports. I think it's fantastic. I mean, these, the athletes who are doing this have earned a platform and they should expand the platform as much as they are, can do. And as much as, as, I mean, even more than they're allowed to do, because anyone who thinks that sports isn't the place to, you know, talk, whether it's politics or race or anything else, um, doesn't know what they're talking about in my opinion I, I just think that it's um it's it's the best place to talk about it because guess what the places that are supposed to be talking about these things aren't really talking about them at all i i strongly uh, support you mr fox uh, i strongly believe that uh, it's a question of leadership mm -hmm. and what we see right now it's it's a pure leadership uh, initiative and i i i I think that more organizations should take uh, this leadership as well, because it starts with education. And this is what I, when, my, when I started to talk about it, I said the first part to uh, have a better future is to educate. And this is a part of it. This is the education that we would like to give to the, to the next generation. So I, I strongly support that uh, athletes that our role models will be educators and will, will stand for uh, tolerance and anti-racism and anti-violence. You, you know, we have this in Europe as well. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the soccer championship of Europe. Uh, so basically what they have is uh, major soccer players like Ronaldo and Messi, maybe you heard those names, um, are taking part of educating the next generation and talking about those issues of, of racism. So it's not only in the NBA. You will find it in Europe, and of course you will find it in Israel as well. Because as I, as I said, the governments are into it. The governments are trying to reduce the level of violence, to reduce the level of, of racism, and, and role models and super athletes are, you know, that they have the most influence on, on teenage and they mm -hmm. should take a stand and leadership on, on, on it. We're right at three o'clock and I know uh, Katie's got another call that she has to jump on, but what I'd like to do now is just kind of give you all opportunity to give uh, your final thoughts, what you want people to be thinking about, what your hopes are for the future. As you're thinking about that and what you want to say, the participants, now is the time for you to go in the chat room and leave the love notes for the panelists. Let them know that you appreciated them sharing their experience and how transparent they um, have been. So if you're um, one of the attendees, go ahead and go in the chat and let folks know um, how 
uh, you're, have you been responding to this conversation? Because they can see your comments and those that can't, I'll share them afterwards. Katie, uh, hopes for the future around uh, sports, uh, final words, final thoughts. <laughs> I knew you'd call me first and I was hoping you wouldn't. No, I appreciate it. I, you know, I, I agree with what everyone said. I mean, I think th there's an opportunity in sports to, to be an equalizer and to, and to show the way in terms of, um, you know, inclusion. I think it's right that athletes are speaking out. Uh, you can't separate your humanity from your athleticism. Right. Um, and, you know, so, so I guess I'll just, I'll end it there. Thank you. If you got to jump off, feel free to do that. No, I want to hear what everybody else says. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Let, why, Londa, we'll go to you. <laughs> um, I agree. We can't separate the sport from the human. Um, you put on a, a jersey or a, a uniform, but at the end of the day, you are human, having human experiences. And I think whether it's uh, grade school, middle school, high school, college, or professional, is that when we try to separate um, the sport from the humanity of each individual, uh, whether it's an individual or collective, uh, then we lose the spirit of um, working together uh, for the common good of, of, of the United States or, or the world. So uh, sports has a role of developing who you are um, spiritually, mentally, and physically. And we can't lose that. How about you, Peter? No, I think I'll, I'm going to say something real similar to Yolanda. I, 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 since we're talking about sports, I think the message I'd want to say is to parents and to anyone who's listening, play. You got to play. Be, get involved and play and, and, you know, set goals and have expectations of yourself. But the first step is, is join, getting on the team, getting in the game, and – experiencing what all the ups and downs of it because it's going it, to if you open yourself up to the sport it's going to change your life and it certainly changed mine um and it, it's not just about the sport it's about the people you meet the coaches that you get exposed to the friends you make the parents that you meet of, of your teammates all those things are, are really what the beauty of sports is and 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 you you it is i don't want to say it's the great equalizer because i don't know that i it, it all is it's always going to be that way but it is it's the great uh it's the place where people still can truly become a melting pot in america i think and anywhere around the world where you are everyone from all kinds of different cultures socioeconomical backgrounds you you get in a game and all that stuff should go away rice yeah um just listening everybody had great comments by the way um just thinking about what everybody said and thinking about this conversation and, and what race and how race and sports come together for me. Um, one thing that I can say is, you know, on the field that or, or whatever sport you're in, um, in that sport within itself, there is no racism. And I believe when you do get on the field, when you get on the court, wherever you get, whatever racism or whatever uh, uh, prejudices or, you know, ill feelings may have existed before you came on that court. Once you get into the sport, the thing that sports do is they provide the platform for those misunderstandings to be uh, understood, that communication to open up. And really, I feel like that's the place where, you know, those races or, or discrepancies or whatever you want to call it around race, they can disappear on the platform of, of sports. And that's the biggest thing that I've gotten out of it is the relationships I've met, the people uh, the, that, I've, that I've had and cultivated, the people that I've met, and just the person you become, you know, learning that in order to win, it takes all of us. And it doesn't matter, you know, really what you look like. It, it matters what you're made of and who you are. Tori? got to get off mute first right um i think through 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 all of this conversation and then all of the learning and growth that i've done um in the last couple of months i think i'm very hopeful right like i i think the conversations are going to be um are going to be the best thing that happened out of this and that's where it starts right so but let's not let it stop at the conversation that we're having right here if you guys i mean reach out to me if you don't 
understand something or want to, I mean, if you're white and you want to understand something, if you're black, you're going through something, you want to understand it through sports, reach out to somebody and speak to somebody who's not like you uh, because it, it shouldn't just end after this conversation. It shouldn't just end after the Zoom call. You should be uh, seeing these things outside of, outside in your daily life. Um, and that's the only way that we can change this. Like having impactful conversations is the only way that we can um, get better. And David? Well, I, I think I have approximately 40 years of experience regarding this issue. Since I started my career, I'm now 53 years old and I've seen the changes. I've seen the changes since I started my career when I was 17, 18, 19 years old until today. And I'm very optimistic about the future. I'm very optimistic. I think the world has changed. The world has made a lot of progress. Governments are into it. A lot of money is invested in, into those initiatives and programs and, and sports club and, and different activities that will bring people together. And as I mentioned before, it's all about education. And it's all about leadership. And if it doesn't help, you have the law enforcement community that will take care of the ones that doesn't respect uh, other people only because they're different from them. So I'm very optimistic about the future. The world has made a huge step regarding this issue of sports and racism. And I think that in 20, 30 years from now, we'll have another Zoom discussion, but that, will, that is not going to be the subject. We'll find something else to talk about. We'll be uh, in 3D then, well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll be a different well, Thank time. you. And, and thank you for having me. Thank you for having oh, me. Oh, yeah, of course. Thank you for being this here. Time. Tanya, uh, my partner uh, in this and many other things, final words, um, thoughts you have? So there's, wow, there's so much that has resonated with me. But what I want to say is that, um, again, there was a couple of people who touched, about, uh, touched upon leadership. It's up, to, it's up to us because we're all leaders, both on social media, off social media, in the public and in private, to you know, to act and do and walk the talk and 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 act like it because otherwise things will never change. Um, and I think so many of you, you know, all of you who are on this panel are doing exactly that. And you guys are role models, and we need to constantly, you know, in um, kind of pound it in, not only with. The, not only with the youth, but with people our own age, because I think the biggest battle is with people who are ingrained in their own habits. And so I think this type of conversation is so um, empowering. And I think um, what you said was so insightful and very meaningful. And I appreciate everybody being on this panel. Me too. And you all look great. Do you guys still play? <laughs> not basketball <laughs> tennis tennis a little a little <laughs> a little bit <laughs> okay so we did we we went over just a little bit we're nine minutes over at this point so um there's we still have some we got like 40 people that are left here so the attendees at i'm gonna do what i normally do and play a little cool video and this is kind of um in honor of david being here i found an uh, interesting video about um what we call soccer the rest of the world calls uh football it's football. about four minutes i'm gonna play that uh for it and it's a different perspective just something different than we would normally um think about or hear about in the u.s and as i'm playing that quick four minute video if any of the panelists have to hop off katie had to leave feel free to do that any of the attendees you gotta hop off feel free but if you have a little time watch that four minute video with us while we're doing that attendees go into the chat Again, keep leaving those love notes and then leave any messages for me that you have about other um, ideas of conversation that you like to see us have, speakers that you'd like to see us talk to, um, any topics related to race or not. I always read the chat and it really helps us with our programming. So I'm gonna share my screen here and go to this video. Start leaving those love notes and those comments and they, and in the chat for me and then we'll watch this together. I think one of the things I felt was I was defenseless. Well, remember when I started, there was only two or three black faces, you know, and that was it. What do you do when you've got a bank of thousands of people shouting abuse at you? The only thing a serious to say on a regular basis, I'll show them, I'll show them. I can achieve this, I can achieve that. In the 70s, there was this massive explosion because you could not deny talent. We didn't know how many black players were going to emerge from what we did. I think they're tough guys. You had to be 
strong, like very, very strong to live back then. It's a thing we have to go through to get to the point we are now. We said we aren't going to let them drive us off. This is our flipping sport, this is our profession. We're going to see you next week, we're going to see you next month, we're going to see you next year. At the end of the Second World War, people from the Commonwealth were invited to Britain to help rebuild a country on its knees. They're all full of hope for the future, so let's make them very welcome as they begin their new life over here. My mum sent my brother myself to England and she joined us with my sister uh, two years later, but she sold it to us as a bit of a, an adventure. But at school, as a nine-year-old, I was called a chocolate drop, and that was my first introduction to the sort of racism. You know, we were invited here, we're part of the Commonwealth, um, but the welcome wasn't as warm as we'd expected. What helped me, what gave me the inspiration to be something was Brian Clough, simple as that. He didn't have all that much confidence. I don't think he's, he's got total confidence at the moment, even now. I remember playing in Car at, Car at Carlisle, and he said, uh, I thought I told you to warm up. I said, well, I have been warmed up, but they're throwing bananas, eggs and pears at me. He went, you get back out there and get me two pears and a banana. And I got up, like I would do, young lad, 17, go out and did. Then he pulls me afterwards and says, you let people like these dictate to you, you're never going to have a career. Britain was a country divided and in recession, with a prominent far right that saw football as a place to recruit. I remember going to places like West Ham and Chelsea, national front round there with the leaflets. Authorities did nothing about it. As the 70s progressed, a group of players too brilliant to ignore braved the abuse and began to break through. West Brom took what was then the highly unusual step of including three black footballers in their side. Striker Cyril Regis, winger Laurie Cunningham and fullback Brendan Batson helped transform the Albion into title challengers. Then in November 1978, a seminal moment as finally a black player was selected for the England senior team. What does being picked for England mean to you? Oh, it's tremendous, tremendous. I've never thought it happened to me, have you? I mean, to be first at anything is a great achievement. I, that's all I ever say. And um, I'm very proud. I'm very proud to be an Englishman. I'm very proud to play for my country. A month later, with booze raining down from the terraces, Regis, Cunningham and Batson helped destroy Manchester United at Old Trafford. Some unsavoury barracking of the black players from certain sections of the crowd, which says nothing for their sportsmanship at all. Just a nicely weighted little pass for Ali Brown, who's turned inside Brian Greenoff. On for Regis. Oh, what a goal! Regis's ability earned him an England call-up. It also saw his life threatened. We used to get our um, post, and uh, letters were there in our cubby holes. I think Cyril took it out. It fell out. We could feel something. It fell out, and there was a bullet. And I think the letter said, I'm paraphrasing, you know, if you put on the white shirt of England, this is for you. Decades later, abroad and at home, racism remains a huge problem for the game. Five times in seven months, while playing for club and country, teenager Rianne Brewster was abused for the colour of his skin. Little action was taken. At the time, nothing really, really happened. I think the Spartak Moscow, the fans, they got 500 seats, I said, which they didn't even sit in anyway. There was a player that was banned for four games, five games, and all the other times, uh, not enough evidence, to be honest. No one heard, it was just me, so my word against his. I wanted to, to hurt them, but now I think I'd probably want to hurt them in other ways, probably want to score, score, shove it in the face. You're a clown, you're stupid. Obviously, you're not better than me at football, that's why you, that's why you have to do something like that. What should they be doing? as opposed to closing 500 seats or banning a player for a few games. Keep the team out of the, the competition. There's nothing else. Make the fines at four million, five million pounds, where they go, whoa, this is serious stuff now. We can't allow these people in our stadiums. Are you ready to walk off a football pitch if you have to? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll walk off a pitch if, if, I, if the team's behind me. It should be not the players looking to walk off the pitch, it should be the manager or the chairman of a club saying, this is enough, enough's enough, I'm getting my players off. But if any player, if any black player wanted to walk off the pitch, I'd support them 100%. Generally, things have improved. We shouldn't forget we've come a long way in terms of the bad old days in the 70s and 80s. They stood up to it and got on with it. <laughs>
that players can do this or can do that. I've got a mad respect for, for players that, that happen to them and they just carry on. It's nah, amazing to see. We're all part of the journey and those who come after us, hopefully they recognise the contribution that you've made. Might have not got to this play, we'd have been a society where everybody's happy to play and enjoy the people who are playing on the football field, no matter what colour their skin is. Thank you, thank you for the video. Advertisement. Football. Not soccer. I was looking at it at first. I thought it was, I was like, wait, no, this is the other football. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey. Thank this you, was Corey. great. You guys are all awesome. Thank you for including me. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Good Tanya, again, David. Corey, Joe, love you. Thank yeah. you again for partnering with me on this. This is fantastic. Yeah, this is this has been great. I'm getting text messages. People said this was. I mean, it's a the subject is not fun, but it was uh, fun to talk about it with you guys. <laughs> All right, thanks. Corey. We gotta get we gotta get get together in person again the next time uh, you come. Or we'll come to you. That might be fun. <laughs> yeah. Bless you all. Bless your kids. I hope your kids are fine. Yeah. Bye -bye. Good. Thank you. Corey, Joe. Bye. Gotta reconnect. Yeah, we'll 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 um next week I'll send you some dates for next week. Okay, perfect. All right. All right, fuel fuelers, we're cooking up me and Tanya cooking up some more good stuff for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Talk to you later. Bye everybody. Get back to work. <laughs>